I think modern mythology is such an important part of uh, understanding, you know, the world we live in. And I think, you know, great, you know, comic book artists like Stan Lee and that have, have discovered, you know, these stories that have perpetuated great followings and uh, now great movies. And uh, I think Hollywood's noticed, like, so many years after the geeks figured it out, that there's a lot of value in these stories. Uh, but I find it really humbling to be able to play, you know, with some of the great, you know, filmmakers like... Uh, you know, in The Hobbit, uh, you know, working with Peter Jackson, uh, you know, working alongside, uh, you know, Stephen Amell in Arrow has been has been a great fun adventure. I think a lot of people sort of uh, got behind Deathstroke, even though he was the, even though he was the bad guy. You know, he uh, you know he had he had two sides to the coin, and uh, you know it was an interesting way that that they developed that character as opposed to the way that the character was was developed in the DC comic world, but. And that was one of the one of the things I had to sort of like try to work with to, to keep an honor about that character, but still sort of play him off as a Mirakuru, heartbroken kind of guy, rather than a, a guy that was defending the son of the, the death of his son through the Teen Titans and stuff like that. Slightly different storylines, but uh, but yeah, I'm just here to answer your questions. If you uh, you know if you want to know anything, and I mean you know I'm very as I say I'm very open about what I do and the emotions that I put into my work. So. You know, if you want to know a bit about about my choices uh, and and whatnot, then then sh shoot shoot uh, questions that are, are are personal if you if if you want. You know, don't feel don't feel embarrassed and get up and go, oh, hi, Mr. Bennett. I just want to know the costume. You know, ask whatever you want. I'm 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 very personable. Um, we might as well get into the questions. What do you got there? Hi, my name is Amanda. I was just talking to you. Um, I know you just. <laughs> And Amanda person. just gave me a Deathstroke hat. I'd never seen a Deathstroke hat. They're so cool. <laughs> like a cap. Um, I was wondering, was that really completely you naked in Spartacus? Oh, well. <laughs> Did I say ask personal questions? <laughs> ah, okay. I figured I'd jump right into it. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, 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 funny, the, the, the funniest thing about that particular question, right, was somebody posted on the internet, you know, I, 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 are there a lot of kids in the audience? Because if there are, there's some going on over there, kids. <laughs> Just go that way. No, but uh, some, somebody, somebody uh, posted something on, on the internet where they had two photos of me from two different naked scenes in Spartacus. And they'd, 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 they'd kind of said, like, you know, there's, there seemed to be a size difference. So... So the question went out there about whether I was wearing a prosthetic, right? And I thought it was so funny. And, 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 and the reality of it was this, was that it was really, really cold <laughs> when we were filming Spartacus, right? And all the guys would get up the back of the room and they'd be like, Arr! you know, so that when they turned around and they were on camera, they'd have a bit of leverage, you know, because <laughs> it was going out to the whole world. So... Uh, on this one particular day, in one of these photos that that appeared on online, you know, I, it was a it was a really cold day, and I remember <laughs> I, I remember saying to the director, "Look, there's nothing I can do here. You got to help me out. Like, you know, it's it's freezing," and and he said, "Look, it's okay. We'll just take the shot, and then we'll just you know we'll come up, and then we'll we'll shoot." Who, who are the Spartacus fans here? Woo! Okay, so do you remember the scene where I was taken downstairs in season one, and I was paraded in front of Lucretia and Alithia? And, and Navia was there as well. It was actually, as an acting scene, it was a really great scene. Because basically I was being exposed as a piece of flesh to these two women of Roman power. And at the same time, the girl that I really was in love with was standing there watching me in my humility. And all of those layers, you know, I, I don't think I said anything in the scene. I think Alithia came up and she said, she said something uh, about me wanting, wanting to, would I, am I scared of dying in the arena? And I think I said something along the lines of, there, there is no greater glory. You know, but, but there was so much emotion in that particular line, like I wanted to kill her. And at the same time, I was trying to be brave and, and, and uh, maybe, maybe sort of, you know, big noting myself in front of the woman that I loved. You know, it was, it, was, it was always always these varying layers that were going on there. But getting back to my personal parts, <laughs> it was freezing. <laughs> and so and so 
the director promised me he'd, he'd, he'd pan off. It just so happened about two months later, I was, I was filming another, uh, you know, later episode, and one of the directors was on set, and he had, like, he had, like, the, the, the mix of that particular episode on his laptop, and he was going through it to make some choices on editing and stuff. And I said, oh, can I see this, that scene? Can I, can I have a look at this? And he went, oh, yeah, sure. And I played it back. And when I dropped my sub Ligaria, the camera just stayed there. And it just stayed there. And, <laughs> and like, Alithia came and walked around me. And it just, stayed. I mean, you could have gone and made a cup of coffee and come back. And anyway, it's, it's, it's still there. It's still there. But, yeah. So, so I, I had a comp particular complaint about that because I... Because I'd, I'd said to the director in particular, that actually, that moment led to a situation where a couple of other actors were a little bit uncomfortable about how long they'd have to appear naked for, you know, where, where, you, where you could be. So we, we had this meeting with the producers, and it was defined that they couldn't remain on a naked shot more than three seconds. And that was the rule from that point onwards. But, uh, but in that particular shot, yeah, I was, I was very cold. And so that was one of the shots. And then in the other one, it was probably sh taken during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, there was just the, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't want to go on because there, there are kids in the audience. But there was a bit of blood flow and there was a difference, right? <laughs> and so, so, yeah, this whole, this whole funny question about, you know, was I wearing something was just, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yes, it was me. In the short and the long of it, yes, it was me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I wanted to say something about the nudity in that particular show because it's, it's sort of important to address because when our show first came to air, there was a lot of critics out there talking about, you know, that it was just blood and guts and nudity and orgies and all this sort of stuff, and it wasn't. Like, who were the Spartacus fans again? I mean... You know, like, like, I like to think that that was really a lot of raw energy that went into that, and that the people that did go through those particular uh, degrading scenarios as slaves back in those days would have had the same limitations put upon them. And, and, and the way that it played with the character, I mean, the way that my character arced through that series was such a great, a great honor as an actor to get something like this. It's like, it's like getting an amazing piece of piano music, and it starts off here and then it just starts belting the keys and then it you know it keeps on changing its dynamic all the time it was an incredible role but you know um for us as a show we didn't really start getting critical acclaim until maybe a year or even two after we the production came to air and then all of a sudden this undercurrent of fandom and i have to thank the fans started saying i mean it happened like that it wasn't that people were were just naturally going to the show because of advertisement. People were just talking online and saying, have you seen Spartacus? Have you watched this show? Because it's really ballsy, you know, but excuse the pun. But, but it was, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, I'm, I, still to this day, you know, out of all the roles that I've done, it was uh, one of the most, you know, one of the deepest, most engaging uh, roles that I, that I could have been offered. Uh, and, you know, it, it, was, it was really a life changer for me. It, it, it gave me an international stage and... Uh, and my career has sort of has been built upon it. So uh, thanks, Spartacus fans. Yeah. Hey, buddy. All right, my name is Kevin, and, and I'm going to ask, how long did it typically take you guys to film um, the Coliseum scenes where you're fighting? The which one, sorry? All the fight scenes. Uh, in, in, in Spartacus or in? Yeah, in, oh, sorry, in Spartacus. Yeah, you, you know, it was... The interesting thing about Spartacus versus Arrow... Uh, in New Zealand, we have a completely different set of rules. Like, for instance, we have a we have a we have a medical insurance thing in our country called ACC, which basically means if you're injured in the workplace, you you can't sue, but you'll be covered by the the government in terms of you know if you get an injury, they'll pay for your medical bills and stuff like that. Uh, in America, you can sue. And in Canada, you can sue. So if I was on set and, say, an extra came on and they were carrying a real sword, which happened two times, two times I was in the middle of a fight and a guy cut me across my chest in the middle of a big fight scene and I felt the blade cut through my chest and I looked down and there was blood coming down and I went, whoa, whoa, stop, stop. Mate, have you got a real sword? And this guy was like, he was an extra, you know, and he's going, yeah, yeah, I do. 
And I said, mate, you're not, <laughs> you're not meant to use, you just went to stab me in the heart and I just got out of the way in time and you, you've cut me across the chest. And, and like the, you know, the, the person who was giving the weapons on set went, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know how that got in the mix. Because we had three different types of swords. We had these really soft rubber ones when we were really whacking the hell out of each other. Then we had sort of semi-hard ones for when they were in shooting close because the, you know, the foam ones don't look real, so they get these sort of uh, better shaped, harder models. And then you've got steel ones that you're only meant to use when you're standing there uh, you know, on a big close-up so you can see the glint of steel. But this extra had somehow gone and found one of these real ones and picked it up and brought it out onto the set. And that happened twice. I was in another, another scene and a guy cut me through the wrist. And I, and I went, whoa, look, you got a real sword, mate. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. But, uh, but you know, the fight, the, with, with, with Spartacus, I did all of my own fights. Uh, you know, and I was really proud of that, you know. I sort of, uh, I had a lot of dance history uh, behind me. And uh, I played a lot of contact sport as well, rugby and stuff like that. So, you know, I really like to engage in all the physical sides of my roles. When I got onto Arrow and I got up to Canada, it's a different scenario. And, and the, the stunt guys, the stunt union is very strong up there. So what happens is when you get to a stunt, the stunt guy comes in, he says, okay, that's it, it's stunt time. And they move you back and a stunt guy comes in. And I, I really found that, I don't know, I, I, was, I, I was like, what? I'm not, I'm not gonna get to do my fight? But the, the stunt guy said something to me. Uh, that, you know, he said something that made a lot of sense. He said, you know, James, who's your stunt double, he just had a baby, right? He studied his whole life to be a stunt guy. And this is a scene where if you get hurt, we lose you from the, from the set. And if you do the role, then he doesn't do the job and he doesn't get the pay packet to take home to buy nappies for his baby. And it really made a lot of sense. You know, as an actor, sometimes you want to get in here, you want to do everything. But there's a lighting guy, there's a sound guy, there's an editor, there's a makeup person, there's a costume person, there's all these little integral jobs. And sometimes you just got to sit back and have faith in the fact that everybody knows how to do their job and you just do your bit. And when it comes to fights, sometimes if you're involved in it personally, like I was in Spartacus, yeah, the process is, uh, you know, is, is long. But, but you know, with, with Arrow, I'd do the acting scene and then it'd get to the stunt moment and I'd step off. And I hate saying that because everyone goes, oh, really? It wasn't you? But that's just the truth of it, you know? That's, and that's the difference between Spartacus and, and, and Arrow. I mean, I wish I could have built, beat the hell out of Oliver. <laughs> Maybe they knew I was, that was going on in my head as well. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right, thank you. No worries, mate. Hi, Manu, I wanted to thank you for coming last year. You and the Spartacus cast made it a great Fourth of July weekend. And I also wanted to thank you again for coming back and extending your days. Now we have you, you know, straight through till Sunday. I appreciate that. Uh, my question, we always look forward to seeing more of you. What can we expect? Can you tell us about the MTV um, Shannara project and, and what you brought to that? Yeah, well, I, 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 he's speaking about my new role. Uh, it, was, it was funny. After, after I'd finished, uh, finished up on Arrows Season 2, uh, I went down to Los Angeles. Uh, with Arrow, they got to the end of Season 2 and they said to me, look, we want to use you, but... We're only going to we're going to bring a new character, Raz Al Ghul, who's going to be here sitting next to me uh, uh, tomorrow. I think he's arriving. Uh, the guy who played Raz Al Ghul, and uh, they said they were going to bring him in. And so, what I had was I had a contract with them as a full-time actor, and so they broke that contract, and which left me open to take other roles. And uh, I went down to Los Angeles and I got I got cast in this new show called Shannara. Does anybody know Shannara by Terry Brooks? Yeah, do you know Alanon? Yeah, yeah. Well, Al Alanon's a pretty badass uh, druid, you know. And uh, I, I didn't really know much about the book, but a friend of mine had read the series. And when I told him about it, I said to him, "I don't, I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know whether it's a like a Harry Potter kind of kids' journey, or or whether it's Lord of the Rings and meets the Hobbit kind of thing, or or whether it's Legend of the Seeker. I wasn't quite sure what shape this show was going to be." Uh, and I only had overnight to think about it. My manager rang me and said, listen, we're going to send you in for this audition for this show called Shannara, but they're going to do a test deal for you. So you have to make your mind up tonight 
whether you'd be willing to do it. Because if you go in there tomorrow and you read for it, we're going to have to be under contract. So if they like you, we have to agree on the number, you know, and you, how much we're going to get for an episode. And, uh, but if they say yes, then you tie it in. And I had very, very short time to think about it. It was shooting back in New Zealand, and I knew that that would mean that I'd get to go back and work with all the guys that I work with on Spartacus, or the same production team. It was uh, being produced by John Favreau, uh, who did Iron Man. And MTV were going to throw a lot of money at it. Now, MTV's, you know, not really renowned as a, you know, like HBO or, a, you know, they're, they're, they're not one of the big players in the original programming. But neither was Stars when Stars made Spartacus. So I think I'm going on a bit of a new journey again, a new cutting edge thing for a network where, where you know, MTV are really going to try to lift the bar with Shannara and have a lot of production value in it. I just did some ADR for it and I saw some of the, you know, special effects put into place and stuff like that. And it's looking amazing, you know, it really is. And, and my character, if you, well, you're fans of my stuff, I think it's another good step in, in, a, in, a, in a good direction for a really strong character for me to be able to get, on, get back on the screen with something new. So, uh, and there's something else coming up in September which I can't tell you about, but stay tuned on that. But, uh, but yeah, but Shannara's, uh, Shannara's going to be released at the end of the year. Uh, next week we go to San Diego Comic Con and they're going to release the trailer for it. So you'll see a bit more of, of what it's going to be about. Yeah, yeah. We look forward to seeing you the whole weekend too. Thank you. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thank you. Hey. Hi. I'm Austin. Austin. Uh, growing up, what inspired you to become an actor? Who. Uh, you know, the truth of that is uh, when I was 14 years old, uh, I, uh, my mother asked me if I'd go and uh, watch a play with her. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, mum, I'm, go, I'm going to the movies with my friends. So I, uh, I went into town and I went to the cinema and I was standing in line with my friends to go watch a movie. And this sudden feeling came over me and I, I said to my friends, I gotta go, I gotta go. And I ran out of this cinema and I ran all the way home and my mum had left already. And so I went into my dad's top drawer and I s stole all his change. He had this change drawer and I took all this money and got a taxi and I went to this, this theater. And I got there late and you know how the usher doesn't let you into the theater when a play started? So I'm banging on this door and this guy came out, he goes, go away. So when he started, no, no, please, please, my mum's in there. I really, I really want to come in and, you know, my mum asked me to come and watch this play with her. And, and this guy let me in and I, and I walked in and there was this spotlight and it was illuminating my mother. I remember walking in and it was illuminating her and she turned around. My mother was beautiful, so beautiful. She was an amazing woman. And she looked at me and she smiled. And I went and sat next to her. And uh, when the play finished, we, we went out of the, out of the theater and we, we met my father, came and picked us up and we just drove around the corner and we went through an intersection and a drunk driver came through and hit the car and the car spun into the air and went into a telegraph pole. Uh, my mother was killed. Uh, my father braced the steering wheel and survived. And when he looked into the back seat, he couldn't see me. I'd gone flying out the side window. And he came out and this drunk guy walked up to him and was like, oh, it's going to be okay, mate, it's going to be okay. My dad went over and wanted to kill this guy, obviously, you know. And he, he started to. But then he noticed me over in a corner, like 100 meters, like I'd, I'd flown so far through the air that later on a police officer who interviewed me told me that he didn't know how I didn't die just from the, the distance that I traveled. Uh, my dad came over. I remember waking up momentarily and I remember having just like, I've got a scar across the top of my head here. A lot of people wondered whether that was a scar for Crixus that they put on there, but that's a real scar that goes across the top of my eye. I went through the window and so that, that cut all that open and, it, and, the, and when I hit the road, it split that area there. So when I woke up, I thought I'd lost my eye because there was this big hole here. All the skin had come down. And uh, I looked at my dad momentarily and I, I felt this real dizziness come over me and I, and I, I said to him that I was going to... I thought I was going to die at that moment, and I, and I passed out. I was in a coma for two weeks, and when I woke up, uh, you know, I woke up to the news that my mother had been killed. Uh, I kind of was then a young kid with a lot of emotions. And, you know, I came from a small town where, you know, it could have been easy to fall in between the cracks. But my, uh, my girlfriend at the time was a ballet dancer, 
And she said to me, listen, why don't you come and dance? You know, just let your emotion out with, some art, with this art form. And so I did. And I got really good at dancing. And then on the other side, I had this kind of, you know, and that, that sort of helped me on my artistic side. But then I was a good rugby player as well. So to get rid of the anger, I went out and played sport, contact sport. And I, and I, you know, I became a good rugby player. At one stage, I was up for the Australian rugby union team. I could have gone to the trials for the Australian rugby union team for schoolboys. And uh, I had to turn it down because I was doing Swan Lake. And all these big guys were going, what? I was going, oh, guys, I'd love to, but <laughs> I'm playing the crow in Swan Lake. <laughs> you know? And at that point in my life, that was, that was interesting when that happened because I was sort of going in a, in a way that was physical and sporty. And then there was this art side that I'd, I'd become good at as well. And I was offered a scholarship to go and study ballet in New York. And at that time, I'd, I'd thought about dancing so hard about whether it was my future. And I suddenly just changed my mind and I said, no, I'm going I'm to go and study dance and drama at this course in Sydney. And, and the, th the thing about dancing was there was no speaking. And I'm, I'm a Maori, I'm a New Zealand Maori from New Zealand, and, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a Polynesian race like Hawaiians or whatever. But speaking and narration is a very important part of our culture. And I think it was just in me to speak as part of my art, you know. So, uh, so I went and studied acting and uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't take long for, you know, people who could help me to realize that I was carrying a lot of emotion, that I was physical, and that I was probably honest. Because the only reason that I ever did any of that was to try to just deal with what was on my plate in life. And so that was my approach to the whole thing. In between it, I gotta tell you, like it's not an easy ride for anybody to get into sort of like a, an industry like the acting industry and, 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 and stay well focused the whole way, you know, it can be very tough. There, there are times where, you know, I didn't, I didn't know whether I'd get through the eye of the needle. You know, when you're putting your heart on the line and you're basing everything upon some of my experiences of the past, you know, it can be really hurtful to think you go into a room and there's just all these good looking guys that look just like you or better or whatever and they get the roles and you're kind of like thinking like, you know, is my heart right for this? Am I strong enough to, to, to actually make it through? But, uh, but I did, you know, I, I, I did somehow. I think persistence and time. You know, some, some young people come up to me and they go, oh, how do you become an actor? I really want to be an actor. And I've got to look at them long and hard and, and say, it's a long journey, kid. You know, it's a really long journey. And you've got, you got to really use a lot of what's in here and a lot of what's in here and meet a lot of people and meet a lot of casting agents and go to a lot of auditions and, and, and go through this painstakingly long process to become somebody who's going to end up being successful in the industry. But uh, what was the question again? <laughs> I think I've gone completely off track. Well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries, mate. Hey, cheers. <laughs> Sorry, my adjudicator's back here in the corner. Are you okay over there, darling? I'm good. Okay, okay. How are you doing? You enjoying it here? I'm just, I'm just answering these questions now. Happy to be back <laughs> down in Miami. Hi, my name's Saba. Hey, buddy. Um, I was going to ask you which, did you, which role did you like playing better, um, Deathstroke or Crixus? Yeah, you know, you know Crixus was, was a, a full journey for me, you know, and there were so many arcs in his journey. I mean, one of the really unfortunate things that happened in our show was that Andy Whitfield, you know, our first Spartacus, the most amazing young actor with a huge career in front of him, two young kids and a wife, you know, he came down with, uh, with cancer. And that, that took him. And, uh, but as a result of his illness, uh, in order to make the show continue, they had to write this segment that, that didn't, have him, didn't have a Spartacus in it. We had, I mean, it's quite staggering to think that we had an a series of Spartacus called Gods of the Arena that had no Spartacus in it. You know, you don't, you don't run a season of Batman with no Batman or Magnum P.I. without Magnum P.I. You know, it's, it's kind of like it was, it was extraordinary that we managed to pull that off. But Stephen DeKnight just wrote some brilliant prequel material that brought alive all of the characters that were underneath the banner of Spartacus. 
and it gave my character the opportunity to be vulnerable, which was completely different to the way Crixus was in season one. I mean, I, I knew there was going to be an arc in the character that would be redeeming, that would have redemption to it. And when I was, when I was first given the role as, as, as Crixus, I really went back to just some really basic stuff that I'd experienced as a kid uh, with bullies, you know? Like, I, I went to a Maori boy, boys boarding... After my mother died, I got sent off to a boarding school and I went to this Maori boys boarding school. That's where I learned to play rugby. That's how I got really good at rugby. But when I went there, I was really fast and the headmaster put me into the first 15. Except I was new at this school and all the big boys that were there went, how did that young... Aussie guy that's come across here to this boarding school, you know, I'm using a little bit of Aussie. They said, how did that guy get picked for the team? So this biggest guy out of all of them, this guy called Norm Hewitt, came up into this study room and he told everyone to get out and I got up to get out and he said, not you. And he came over and he started to bash the crap out of me. And this guy was a really scary high school bully. He, he went on to be an all black and was a massive guy, but he, he really gave me a beating. And then he followed me around and intimidated me a lot. I based Arzog on him. His name's Norm Hewitt. If you, if you Google Norm Hewitt, you'll see a bald guy with ears that come out like this. He played for the All Blacks, and he was terrifying when I was at school. But, uh, but you know, he, uh, he kind of like uh, was this really intimidating bully, and I really didn't know how to play a bully. So, but when I, when I got the role of Crixus, and I saw that he intimidated Spartacus so much, I just based it upon that chapter of my life and this particular guy, Norm Hewitt. Uh, you know, then, then there was this whole thing about, you know, the connection with Navier and whatnot, which I then pinned back to, you know, coming back to myself in terms of the loss of my mother. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I sort of played this part of Crixus that had been destroyed somehow, which made him a violent gladiator, but then sort of wanted to peel him back through the layers to get back to this very innocent person who really just, you know, had lost the concepts of love and stuff like that. Yeah. So all of those layers that made, made Crixus as a character made him such a compelling thing for me to, to, to do as an acting role. With Deathstroke, that was kind of like entering a whole new kind of genre. Like when, coming into Arrow, Arrow was like a modern contemporary song. It's got rhythm to it that, that's contemporary. You know, like, like Spartacus was like opera and very theatrical, whereas coming onto, onto Arrow, it was just like, it was like a modern pop song. It's like, I'd been, I'd been on the piano going crazy doing this classical thing, and they went, okay, now we want you to play a bit of, you know, New Kids on the Block. <laughs> and, you, you know, I, to change tune into, into Deathstroke was really interesting, because they said to me, we don't want you to play Deathstroke, we don't want, rah, we don't want this, you know. So if Slade Wilson was going to kill somebody, he'd just grab them and, and do a really quick kind of you know, special ops move and break the neck or something or flip yeah. them over and shoot them or, you know, it was all very quick stuff. The rhythm changed. And, but, you know, as an actor, I have to be really thankful for Arrow because I was kind of like a... Spartacus put me on a certain level, you know, in terms of coming through as an actor. But Arrow allowed me to really enter the mainstream American audience, mm -hmm. which gave me more, a stronger uh, presence as an actor. Yeah. You know, and, and then, you know, people, people like, you know, Peter Jackson, you know, picked me up for The Hobbit, things like that. So as a career move, it was a really strong move. And, uh, and I really enjoyed playing the character. I mean, Deathstroke is, 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 is surely one of the most interesting, you know, I mean, is he a villain? Is Deathstroke a villain? No. No, no he's not, yeah. He's a badass. Yeah, so, so, and it was interesting playing somebody with all those dark qualities and then trying to find that keep keep that point of redemption for him or keep that kind of code of honor that he, that he had. As I said, like the storyline in Arrow was a bit different because, you know, it wasn't based upon, you know, the death of his son and his revenge mission on the Teen Titans. Mm -hmm. It was based upon a love story, a love triangle. And that love triangle, by the way, came out of nowhere. I actually suggested it to the writers and they told me later, well, you're the one who suggested it. And yeah, but we, we were on the island and suddenly the writers said to me, ah, oh, you're in love with Shadow. And we'd already shot all these episodes, and I'd, I remember sort of like just gu guiding her around like a small girl, you know? Then they went, no, you're in love with her. I went, really? I, I haven't been playing that. 
But it was it was good. It sort of it just it threw this twist and it and it allowed for the Mirakuru madness or whatever you want to call it to have that kind of almost Shakespearean kind of quality to it. You know, it was all a big mistake. You know, I I thought that he was responsible for her death, and he wasn't. It was kind of like, and then when Shadow started speaking behind me, like, it was, it was a bit like Iago, like in Othello and Shakespeare, you know, it was a bit kind of like, you know, the audience were in on it. They understood the pain that Slade was going through. They understood what his truth was. And even Oliver did to a degree. You know, so, so yeah, made for a really challenging character. But, you know, I mean, look, to be honest, I can't, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't like to think about my roles, about which one's the one I'm, I think is the best. Because, uh, I mean, in this one short lifetime that I'll get, mm -hmm. I'm just so lucky to actually work on, you know, like, really amazing projects with, with great practitioners. Yeah. And each time I get a role, it's, it's a blessing, you know. So, so, you know, I mean, you know, Spartacus was incredible, you know. Yeah, it seems like you were more, like, Spartacus kind of resembled you, your life as a child more. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Good right. point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, mate. Cheers. My name is Jeannie. I love you and Arrow. Would there ever be a chance of you getting your own Deathstroke show or movie? Oh, uh, well, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the, what's, what's going on a lot with it right now, and it seems to be a really interesting kind of challenge for, for the comic book world is, you know, whether you can sustain a character in the TV series if they're taking it to film. You know, like recently, like Deadshot. Yeah. And those guys had to be pulled off of Arrow because they're going to appear in the film version of it. Of, uh, what's the, Suicide Squad? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. That was kind of staggering that that was taking place, that they were actually pulling characters out of Arrow, the TV series, because Warner Brothers wanted to back the film version. I mean, to me, the television version gives you a lot more depth. You get a lot more storyline. You can explore things a lot more, you know, whereas, you know, Deadshot in Suicide Squad's going to probably have six lines and yeah. he'll be there for 90 minutes and then that's it, you know? I would like to know more about Slade Wilson, though. I mean, it would be awesome if you got your own show as him. Yeah, well, he's, he, you know, he's currently sit, sitting down in the bottom of that <laughs> prison cell on Leanne Yu. <laughs> yeah. Wondering whether that might happen himself, but uh, you know, I, I don't know, darling. It's, it's, it's probably not going to happen like that. <laughs> yeah, thank but, uh, you. But thank you. Thanks for following. Yeah. Cheers, sweetheart. I was out with Norm the other night. Hey, man. My name's Mario. Mario. Um, I wanted to ask because on the Hobbit, a lot of the actors in interviews talked about how it was kind of difficult to act naturally with other people because of all the green screen and CGI in the movie. Can you do me a favor? Can you bring the microphone over here? Is that cool, our sound guy? It's just that I have to keep on addressing this side of the... Is that cool? Can you bring it over here, mate? Because then I can sort of... And everyone just sort of come over this way. Sorry, I just, I just keep on turning away from you guys. It's all that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, right. awesome. So would you say you felt the same way in the, with The Hobbit, that uh, the green screen kind of made it harder to act with other people? Uh, the, inter the interesting thing about about green screen, uh, the, Ho the Hobbit wasn't green screen for starters. Right. The Hobbit was filmed in, uh, in, in motion capture, mm -hmm. which means you're basically the green screen. Right. Uh, you know, you become a, a, a whole bunch of dots. <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's, well, it's really well done. I mean, Andy Serkis, you know, when he did Gollum, that was the first really big breakthrough in film or television with a, with a motion capture character. I mean, it was so perfectly done by Andy, Andy Serkis that, you know, it really set the bar high. I, I, you know, basically, what happened was my character of Arzog, he got cast as a seven-foot, you know, orc, right? So they're looking for a seven-foot guy. I went, I went down and did the audition. And here's a, here's a funny story, right? Who are Spartacus fans. Do you remember when the Germans came along? Remember the Germanic tribes? Remember, the, remember that big tall guy? I think his, uh, what was his name? Uh, he, he tried to rape uh, Navia. Yeah, the one who got his face cut off. Yeah, that happened on the show. They cut his face off and it went flipping up in the air. It was a, it was a great special effect. Well, that guy, that particular guy was a, who got cast in that role, I went to high school with. And, um, 
And he rocked up for Spartacus to play this particular character. And, uh, and I was like, man, dude, like, can you believe it? We both went to school together in Australia and we're both on the same show now. And he was like, yeah, 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 cool, eh? And I was like, come to my house for dinner. So he came to my house for dinner and we're, we're sitting there over the dinner table. And I had just gone down and read for Arzog a couple of weeks beforehand and was really excited that I might be in with a chance, right? And he looks, he looks at me over the table while we're eating and he goes, oh, man, I just got rung by Peter Jackson and I got cast in The Hobbit. And I'm like eating and I went, really? <laughs> What role? And he went, oh, I got cast as Arzog. And I was like, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> it kind of, yeah, it, it, was, it was like, I'd, I'd really been hoping I was going to get that role, eh? And he, suddenly he told me over the table that, you know, this is my mate. He'd got it. But I was really happy for him. His name was Bones. We called him Bones in high school. Because at in high school, he was seven foot, you know, he was probably six five when we were in the sixth form. And he used to walk around school like this. <laughs> and he, we called him Bones. He had real skinny sort of presence about him. And one day when we were in our last year of school, he was, uh, he was in the middle of the playground and this guy was bullying him. And I remember sitting there and we are all looking and there was Bones getting picked on again. And all of a sudden he, he wound up these big long skinny arms of his and he went bang, bang, and he knocked this guy who was a year older on his ass. And... We all looked at Bones and went, oh, my Lord. And Bones was looking around the playground, like these big skinny arms. <laughs> and suddenly he became, it's, his whole life changed. Within, within a couple of weeks, he was in our rugby team wearing headgear, playing the guy who jumps up for the ball and the line out. And he suddenly became this physical being. And then he, then he sort of got really big. I don't know how he got that big, but he got that big. He got, he, and he was giant. And he was going to go do the WWE for a while. I think he got a couple of injuries, but he was seven foot tall and just massive, an incredible build, you know. And uh, so, so, you know, when he, when he came for, for Spartacus and then he told me he got Arzog, he went down to film it. So the whole film was shot with this schoolmate of mine playing Arzog in a suit. But the thing about the suits, if, if you've, you know, like in Lord of the Rings, when, when you saw an, an orc, You'd see this, you know, Lawrence McCoya, who's a good mate of mine, Mari actor. He was the, he was the head of the orcs in the, in the Lord of the Rings. But whenever Lawrence's face was in camera, you know, they had these, these fangs that were built into the mask that he was wearing. And he'd go like, ah, 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 ah. and you go back to his face again, and would be like, ah, ah, ah. and there was very little movement. You couldn't get a lot of expression. And so my mate had one of these masks on. And I think the... The thick of it all, the thick and thin of it all, was that basically when Peter got to the editing room, he couldn't see enough expression coming from this particular big character of Arzo. It was one of those moments, like, you know, in Star Wars, how David Proust played Darth Vader, but he had a really, really bad Welsh accent or something. Like, it was a really high-pitched voice. Like, if you ever go on YouTube, look up, look up David Proust, Darth Vader. And you'll, see, you'll hear the actor's voice. He's going like, take the princess away. <laughs> Everyone, back to the Death Star. <laughs> I mean, there's no, oh, Luke, join the dark side. You know, there was none of this really fantastic voice that they then found from James Earl Jones. And, and one of the funny stories about that, if you don't know, is David Proust ended up going to the premiere and he didn't know that his voice had been dubbed <laughs> he'd had a fallout with George Lucas that there'd, there'd been a fallout between the two of them and George Lucas did it to get it up him I don't know I don't know the full length of the story but I've heard that much and so he went, he went and sat there with his popcorn and suddenly his voice was you know it was, it was Darth Vader but it's the same sort of thing happened I guess with with um with the way that Peter sat down and looked at Arzog and thought and he, then he went, oh, you know what? It's not working. And they decided then to remove that performance. And that was a really difficult thing to do, to have had all this stuff filmed and then have to remove this character from the film. And then they decided that they could do it by filming another actor in motion capture, animating that character and putting it over the top of where that other, that other character had been. So it was a really, really big 
risky move because Peter made that decision four months before the premiere. And so they, they'd actually rang up and I was doing Spartacus. I was doing the last two episodes of Spartacus. And I wasn't allowed to go down. My producers would never have let me. And I spoke to my manager in America and I said, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, don't we? And she said, yeah, just fly down. Let's not tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I flew down there. When my, when my producer found out from Spartacus that I'd flown down and done The Hobbit, she lost her shit big time. <laughs> and I just said to her, I said, I, I don't know what to say to you. Like, do you think I wouldn't do it? Like, come on, I'm okay, I survived. But, um, but yeah, so I went down there and I did this motion capture. It didn't take long. I mean, basically, when you're in motion capture, you've got this suit on that's covered in dots, and you know, you've got a camera that goes on over, over, it's on a helmet, and it looks in your face, and you've got all these little dots on your face. So if I go, Wah, you know, if I go, Ubak de Lubnak, you know, as, as, as Arzog, you know, then everything that I do with my face is the, they'll paint over it, but it'll move, it'll move exactly like my face is moving, you know? And I remember being a bit kind of like, because it happened so fast. I was, I was phoned up on like a Monday and I had to be there on the Friday. They didn't give me a script. They told me, it's all going to be given to you when you get down here. You're going to be, you'll get in the hotel when you arrive that night and you'll be shooting first thing in the morning. And I got there and it's in black speech. And I had no idea how to say any of this stuff. It was like trying to learn German overnight. And, uh, and so I had to basically work out what the phonetic the way that I saw it phonetically, and there were people standing around with boards as I walked around doing, doing this performance of Arzog. And the next thing was, when I came out in this little bodysuit, like, how many people like walking around in public in a onesie? <laughs> or a leotard? I tell you, it doesn't make you feel very masculine. And I came out and I had all these little balls all over me, and I was like... <laughs> and that's what I felt like. Except Arzog had to be like, and when I first came out, I thought, all these guys are going to look at me because my seven-foot giant schoolmate was standing in that outfit before, and here I come out looking like Father Christmas's helper. <laughs> and they, luckily, they had, this, they had this screen that sort of showed, like, you know, me up there. They had this, this screen that was showing a really low-resolution example of what... I was as I moved around. It was a sort of a grave, you know, it was, it was Arzog, but a very limited kind of resolution of him. And so I had to look at it. And if I, mo if I, if I moved like me, like this is a good shot, can we go to that wider shot? Can we go to that stage shot that's, that's wider, mate? That's possible? Yeah, so, so I was looking at it, and I was, if I moved like me normally, and I went like this, Arzog kind of just sort of it, it, it didn't, and I, I was looking at it going like, oh, that's not how I got to move, is it? Because <laughs> he was big, he had all this mass. So I, I sort of looked at him and I kind of had to do this kind of... I sort of had to move slow and big. And there was, there was a whole movement skill to it, you know? It's like, it's like me saying to you, and you could do it, trust me, you could do it. If I said, come up here, and you have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger in Mr. Universe. <laughs> like, they'll paint Arnold over you, but you've got to move like him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when you do the flex, you've got to get that confidence flex that he does, right? That's the way that I had to fill out Arzog. The night before I went in, I got out Empire Strikes Back and Jaws. And I based Arzog on the voice of James Earl Jones. I tried to get this really I knew that I knew that uh, I knew that Star Wars had based kind of some of their some of their stormtrooper Darth Vader, but they'd based it on Joseph Campbell had been an advisor. Joseph Campbell wrote this thing called A Hero of a Thousand Faces which linked all cultures together in terms of like how our stories impact on society, heroes and villains and love and hate and all this sort of stuff that's common to every race. And he came on and he advised George Lucas on when, he, when they did stuff with the, with the stormtroopers and Darth Vader, they based it upon the Nazi party. Like the whole thing on the Death Star, there was one big rally where 
Darth Vader walked with a couple of his generals on either side through all of the stormtroopers. And that was set up exactly like Lenny Riefenstahl's um, Triumph of the Will scene, where Hitler was walking with Goebbels and that through the middle of the, the Nazis. So they had based that upon that. And so I, I lent a little, I, I started taking a little bit of that when I did Arzog. Like you'll see at one stage in the, in the very opening scene where I, where I turn around from a back position and I look over my shoulder and then I come forward, I start, I, I'd use this, this thing which was, Adolf Hitler was taught, I know I'm going way off track here, but Adolf Hitler was taught how to do stage presence by a Jewish magician. He went and saw a Jewish magician in Germany do a performance, and he went and asked him how he managed to capture the people's, you know, imagine, imagination and, and, and focus. And so this particular Jewish uh, magician showed him how to do things with his hands and create a speech that would compel people. Anyway, I took a bit of that into Arzog, and, uh, but then... When I watched Jaws, I thought the great thing about Jaws was that you never see the shark, you know, until he comes out. And, and, and you know, there's this, dun, 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 there's this whole lurking thing, and then suddenly, bang, he comes out. So with the very opening scene of, of, uh, of Arzog, I asked Peter if I could stand as far away from these two, you know, you know in The Hobbit when those two little orcs come in and they apologize and they say, oh, we let them get away, and I come down. I was standing as far as I could away from them on the precipice of this castle. And I just had my back because I didn't want anybody to see Arzog's face. So I, I sort of turned around and the whole thing with the wag, you know, that, that wag that I rode, I asked, you know, Peter of the wag, there wasn't anything there, but I said, can it be here and can I come over and pat its head so that I'm being light and gentle so that you're not suspecting any energy from this, this creature? Because, I mean, I could have just stood there and gone, Ugh. But then all of a sudden, all that power was just dissipated in one shot. So I started with my back turned, and then I turned around, and I came down, and I patted this wag that wasn't there, but Peter put him there for me. And then I walked forward. Can you come forward a little bit? And there was this orc. And I said to Peter, can I just stroke his head like he's a kid? And you watch, that's, that's what Isaac does in this particular scene. He goes... And he, he throws him to the wolves and he gets ripped to shreds. <laughs> but it was like I just wanted to get this, I wanted to get this Jaws moment of just cruising in and then just going, Jaws. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. I forgot the question again. God, I'm going so up. It's off okay, page. you answered it. Thanks, man. Yeah, no All worries, right, no guys. Worries. We actually are out of time already. We have to wrap this up. But uh, brother. Hey. sorry to everybody who didn't get to ask a question. Hey, we will have Just another man. panel. Hey. Sorry, uh, Villains of Arrow panel is happening here tomorrow night sorry, at brother. 645 yeah, yeah, if you want to get in hey, some more sorry. questions. Hey, hey. Sorry, darling. Yeah. Oh, and God. let's all hey. give. A, new, a big hey, round of applause. Hey, sorry, Thank you so much for coming. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Come and ask me over there. Hey. Thank you, everybody. I uh, hope you have a really good convention this weekend. And uh, if you want to come and say hello, I'm over there somewhere. Next to Ra's al Ghul. Hmm, that'll be interesting. <laughs> Later.